All right, Claire. All earthly things with earth will fade away. The prayer grasps eternity. But I'm convinced of this, God does not hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer. Prayer is not a position, whether you need. Prayer is not a position, it's a disposition. You get to the place where you'd rather sweat, you'd rather weep in his presence than laugh in anybody else's presence. You'd rather God whisper a speaking into your heart that breaks you. Somebody give you the prizes that all the world covets. Prayer is almost the greatest human privilege that we have. All right, starting a uh, three-week series starting today. So today and then two more weeks. Um, talking to Jesus, a simple guide to prayer. I find it... Um, of, I, I certainly don't find it as a coincidence that for weeks we've planned to be in this series and we've planned to start this series um, and, and we're starting this series on this day, um, a day after one of the greatest prayer warriors I've ever known ever goes to be home with the Lord. Um, so it's just, it's just fitting that we're starting this, uh, starting this today. Um, prayer is something that gets asked about a lot. I think it's something that uh, many of us followers of Jesus struggle with uh, from time to time, sometimes more than others throughout our walk with the Lord. Um, it can be confusing. It can, it can be uh, difficult because it seems like you're not doing it right or it seems like it's ineffective. Uh, you're just not sure. Uh, how do you do it? All of those types of things. Of course, Jesus' disciples asked Jesus the same thing. How do you pray? Teach us to pray, Lord. So this is a question that's been around and, and that I think followers of Jesus have, have always been asking since the very beginning. It's a great question to ask. How can I pray more effectively? Even if you know, even if you, even if you do it often, how can I pray more effectively? How can I communicate with the God of the universe more effectively? Because that's really all prayer is, is communication. It's communication with God and God communicating with us. And I think that's one reason why prayer is difficult, because communication is difficult. To communicate clearly from human to human is not an easy thing to do, much less we feel so inadequate to communicate with the God of the universe. I'll give you an example of that about how, depending on what you say and how you say things and, and, and those types of things, how, how communication can get mixed up. I'm going to read a, a nursery rhyme that all of you know. You follow along with me as I read this nursery rhyme to you. Scintillate, scintillate, globule vivific. Fain with I fathom thy nature specific. Poised in the ether capacious, strongly resembling a gem carbonaceous. Do you all know that nursery rhyme? Of course you do. Let me read it differently. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are up above the world, so high, like a diamond in the sky. Exact same words, exact same meaning, or different words, but exact same meaning. The first one, you had no idea what I was talking about. The second one, that makes sense. That's communication. Sometimes it's not what you know, it's can you get it across to the other person. I think God wants to get a lot across to us. He wants to communicate to us. He wants us to spend time in prayer with Him. <laughs> When it comes to communication, uh, <laughs> I've got several funny stories that I could tell, but there was one that I was thinking about this week, I just couldn't get it out of my brain, about miscommunication, I guess you could say. So, <laughs> one time, uh, my dad and my stepmother were on the way home, they had gone to Dallas, and they were on the way back from Dallas, and uh, my dad, to put it nicely, is difficult of hearing. Dad, if you're watching today, as you are often, Please, for our family's sake, get some hearing aids for the millionth time. <laughs> but my, my stepmother, uh, for medical reasons, is very difficult of hearing. Very, very difficult of hearing. So the conversations between them can get fairly entertaining uh, at times. So they were coming back from Dallas, and my stepmother had bought this jacket. And she says to my dad, my dad thinks, 
do you like this jacket for you? Do you think it will fit? And he looks over at her and says, no. Because he thinks she asked, do you like this jacket for yourself and do you think it will fit you? And he looked over at her and said, no. And he said, as we went down the road, the temperature in the car got a little cold. <laughs> he said, I'm, he's thinking, I don't know what's going on, but something's not, not right. I don't, I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about, but sometimes you can feel that chilly, that chilly temperature. And uh, so they get home and she gets out of the car, doesn't say a word, goes inside the house and my dad goes in, she lays the jacket down. My dad goes in a few minutes later, he picks the jacket up and he tries to put it on, it doesn't fit. And he turns to her and he says, see this jacket doesn't even fit. And she turns and looks at him. She said, it's my jacket. He goes, wait a minute. What did you say to me in the car? <laughs> and she said, I said, I got this new jacket. Do you like it? Do you think it fits? Talking about herself. And uh, so, you know, they were mad at each other and, and, and all those, and there was for no other reason than miscommunication. Communication is difficult, it just is. It's not easy to communicate clearly, properly, and that's what prayer is. And so, really, I don't think we're gonna unearth anything earth-shattering. I really just wanna talk about some of the basic things that Jesus says make effective prayer. Uh, and hopefully between today and the next two weeks coming up, uh, we, we can be more effective in our prayer life because God desires us to be effective in our prayer life. So we're going to look first at uh, Matthew 6. Now Matthew 6 is right uh, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. That's what we call it, the Sermon on the Mount. It, it, it is the Sermon of all sermons. It's when Jesus gives his, this big long message and you know it's things that we still struggle with. It's like here's who God really is, deal with it. And we're still dealing with it over 2,000 years later trying to wrap our heads around it and live it out and, and be those things. Uh, it's a, this section that we're in is a broad section on worship in general, how to properly worship in general and then we're, we're, we're dissecting out a little slice of how prayer fits into worshiping in general. So if you didn't know, in Scripture, Jesus prayed and he talked about prayer. And so that's kind of what we're going to dig into this morning. Matthew 6, starting in verse 5. Whenever you pray, Jesus talking, whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, go into, the, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. As usual with Jesus, He's kind of on the nose when it comes to sharing truth because truth most of the time is kind of on the nose. It kind of just, it hits you right there for what it is. Jesus gives some examples here and today we'll look at one and the next week and the next week we'll look at uh, the next two sections of what we can pull out of here. But I think there's three main things Jesus is saying prayer needs to be, must be, should be. It needs to be sincere. It should be submitting or in submission, and it needs to be synchronized. It needs to be in lockstep with God. So next week we'll look at submitting, and the next week, Lord willing, we'll look at synchronized. This week we're digging in to, to sincere, how to be sincere in your prayers, how to be real and authentic, honest in your communication with God. I believe God desires that from us, and I believe it will make our prayers more effectual as we look at that. So just going back to what we just read there, back in verse five, when it, Jesus says, whenever you pray, you must not be 
like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you pray, us followers of Jesus, but when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. So, what is Jesus saying here? What is he saying? Is he, is he, is he saying and making the argument of versus private versus public prayer? In other words, private prayer is good, public prayer is bad. Is that what Jesus is saying? Anybody have an answer for that? Is that what Jesus is saying? That public prayer is a bad thing? It's wrong? Of course that's not what he's saying. How do we know that? Because Jesus prayed publicly. <laughs> and Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He never sinned. So if praying publicly is wrong, then Jesus was wrong. That's, that's not what he is saying. As I, was go- as I was going through this and studying it and really trying to, trying to kind of flesh it out for myself to, to bring it to you, I just kept coming back to that, that quote from Augustus McRae. As I was going through this stuff, you know, it's, it's like, is it private versus public? Is it this versus that? It's like when he's looking at Woodrow, he says, by God, Woodrow, you just never get the point, do you? I feel like God feels like that with us. Like you guys, you, we, you read my word, but you just don't get the point, do you? You just miss it. And, and it's not private versus public. It's sincere versus hypocritical. Don't be a hypocritical prayer, Jesus is saying. Don't be hypocritical in your prayers. He's not condemning public prayer by any stretch of the imagination. He's just saying don't only pray in public. In other words, if you, if you only pray in public and you never pray in private, then you're not praying to me and for me. You're praying for the benefit of those listening so they will think you're special. You're praying for the ears of man instead of to the heart of God. You're not praying for the right reasons. He's not against public prayer. He's just saying if you only pray in public, you're missing the entire point. Not only are you missing the entire point, you're just a hypocrite. And that's a word nobody, nobody likes to be labeled as. Nobody wants to be labeled as a hypocrite. See, the Pharisees, who he's talking about here, you remember at the beginning of the the paragraph, the Pharisees, they practiced their religion for the applause of man. They were, they, were, they were careful and strategic and bold and in practicing their religion in front of everyone so everyone would think how awesome they were. And it, it says there, that it, the language used there on the, about a street corner is like, the, the original language would be a, referring to a part where a big, broad, wide street. In other words, a street where much traffic will be taking place. Okay, they're not worried about praying to God about things that really matter and, the, and, and about their own sin and all those types of things, but they're going to make sure that they're on that street corner, on that big wide street, and they're praying these big magnificent prayers to show how righteous and how wonderful they are. And Jesus says, that makes me sick. I don't want to hear those prayers. I don't want to hear your hypocritical prayers prayers. I want your sincere prayers, your honest prayers, your real prayers, the prayers that you would pray if no one was listening in your private room. I know many of you through the last several years have, have, you know, you've added prayer closets or prayer rooms. I talked to a lady this past week uh, that's been visiting the church for several weeks, and she talked about how she puts her prayers and and, uh, dry erase marker on her bathroom mirror. She writes them down on the mirror because she said, that's a place I'm going to see every day and she has them written down there the people she's praying for and what she's praying for and she writes it on a mirror i was like that's that's actually really smart you're going to look at that you're going to see it it's going to remind you to pray every day i think those are great great practices i also think praying like we do on sunday mornings as a congregation that's a great thing but if i get up here and i pray to you or pray with you up here but i haven't spent any time all week personally praying and seeking the face of God and seeking the word of God, then when I stand up here and pray in fr- with you, in front of you, to God, I am praying hypocritically. And I'll be honest with you, as I've dug into this this week, that's something that kind of hit me on the nose. God kind of said, hey, buddy, where you been lately? Where you been lately? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you prayed every Sunday, but where you been lately? Have you been, have you been seeking me? in prayer lately, or have you just been passively praying to me lately? I want want you, I want 
your time. And, and I, 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 I prayed for forgiveness right there on the spot. I said, you're right, God. Man, your truth is difficult to swallow sometimes. Well, he'll put it right in your face. Jesus goes on and makes another comparison. He says, when you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles. Don't babble like the Gentiles, since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, because your Father knows the things you need before you ask Him. Therefore, you should pray like this. There's a lot of things in there, a lot of, things that I, a lot of rabbits I could chase, so I'm going to not do that. But he says, don't babble like the Gentiles. I cannot think every single time I read that, I think about the story we talked about a few weeks ago with Elijah. Every single time I, I read that, I think about Elijah standing there in front of the prophets of Baal, praying to Baal, a God that's dead, a God that doesn't exist, a God they can't hear. And, and the longer they pray, the more they say, the louder they get. And Elijah says, hey, maybe he's on vacation. Maybe he's asleep. Pray a little louder. Pray a little longer. Say the right magical formula and maybe your special little bell will hear you and do something. In other words, <laughs> when you're not praying the way God wants you to pray, it's because sometimes you think it matters what you do. In other words, we want the credit. My wonderful prayers. My great prayer plan. My wonderful prayer closet. Look at my prayer journal and how great and wonderful my prayers are. We can't make the focus of our prayers us. The focus of our prayers is who we're praying to. God doesn't need you to talk him into doing anything. Not only does he not need you to, you can't. There's nothing that you or I could say that would ever change the will of God. God wants us to pray and spend time with Him and communicate with Him so that He can affect us, not so that we can affect Him. We've got it backwards sometimes. I know that I have had that in my life. So see, is Jesus, again, is He making a comparison that short prayers are good and long prayers are bad? He says, don't babble on. Don't, don't talk a bunch of words. Is that the point? No, Woodrow, that's not the point. Sometimes long prayers are coming straight from the heart, and there's sometimes there's a whole lot of things to pray about. And sometimes we'd be better off just to cut it off a little shorter and not babble on, thinking that if we just say a little more and say it a little more effectively and have the right combination of words, that somehow that will get God to do what we want Him to do. Again, it's not many words versus few words. It's sincere versus hypocritical. This is why this word is so near and dear to me personally and why I bring it out to us so often. It's why it's one of our three action words. I hope and I pray, literally, that we are a sincere church, an authentic church, a church that shows sincerity to each other, to this world, and to God. Sincere versus hypocritical. How can you say that? In other words, to be sincere, you have to pray with the desire to please God and to know God, not man. If at any point in time you feel your, your heart wanting to say something simply so the person you're praying with can hear it, then you've lost the focus of what the prayer should be. The prayer should be praying to God, to know God, to please God, to pray what He wants to hear, not so that man can pray, can, can hear what you say and say, oh, yes, very good prayer. Very good prayer. I, I really like the way you said those, those special Bible words that was so, we're so proud of you for being such a good prayer. We talked earlier that, that uh, Jesus, not only did he talk about prayer, but he actually prayed. You know, Jesus' prayers are recorded. They're documented in the thing we call God's word, in the Bible. Literal documentation of Jesus' words while on this earth to the Father. Numerous places. We're gonna look at three this morning. And as we look at these things, and as we talk about sincerity, and, and we dig further deep into this, just think about this quote from Warren Wisby. This, 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 this quote just, it's been, uh, I can't get it out of my head. He said, we have no right to ask God for anything that will dishonor his name, delay his kingdom, or disturb his will on this earth. 
heart check on your prayer life. Is what you're praying for, is there any possibility that will dishonor the name of God, that it will delay his kingdom? The advancement of the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ died for you, was laid in the tomb, rose again on the third day to take away your sins and give the gift of eternal life. Is your, are your prayers trying to stand in the way of the advancement of the kingdom or to disturb his will on earth? That statement I cannot get out of my head. But real quick, here for about 10 minutes, we're going to look at three prayers, the only three prayers in the gospel of John that are recorded of Jesus. The first one is in John 11. And when we're looking into this, let's look for the sincerity of Jesus' prayers. This is John 11. On the screen, you can flip to it if you're there, if you want to get there. It says, so they removed the tomb. Now, this is when Jesus is going to deal with the problem that his, one of his best friends, Lazarus, has died. So they removed the tomb, the stone, excuse me. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this, so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, bound hand and foot with linen strips and with his face wrapped in cloth. Now I have no doubt, I have no doubt that you and I want prayers that are effective like that. We want to pray in a way that literally Lazaruses come out of tombs. I know that we desire to do that, but here's what the thing is that we're looking at here. Verse 42. Look at verse 42. Check out Jesus' sincerity. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this. He said, Father, I thank you that you heard me, but I know you always hear me, but the reason that I said that is so the crowd knows that you sent me, okay? So, what am I saying? Think about how real of a prayer that, that little statement is, that Jesus said that in front of them. How could it have been different? How might we have done that differently, more hypocritically? Oh, Lord God in heaven, I bow before you so that thy will hear me. And I hope, Lord, that you hear me. Lord, please hear me. He, he's not putting on any type of front. He's not making it about him. He's making it about the glorification of God. God, I thank you that you hear me. And God, I'm saying that. I know you hear me. I'm not pretending that you don't hear me. I'm saying that because these people need to know that you hear me and that you are the one that gets the credit for what's about to take place. You get the credit for what's about to take place. He's not making it about him. He's not making it about, about anything, anything other than the glorification of God the Father. God the Son is, is praying in a way that God the Father and only God the Father can get the glorification, the credit, the fame for what is about to take place. Such a simple, simple prayer. Such a sincere prayer. Very different prayer if that part of the prayer is not in there. Another prayer, another time. Jesus prays. John chapter 12, verse 27. It says, now my soul is troubled. What should I say, Father? Save me from this hour? But that is why I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Now these chapters here is, is not very far from the crucifixion. And, and, and Jesus has kind of given last, last instructions, last teachings to his disciples, and, and, and last prophetic sayings that are gonna take place before he goes to the cross. And he says there, hey, my time's come, but he says, my soul is troubled. Is that something you think that God walking the earth as a man that's facing what he's about to face would say? That's not what I would say if I were Jesus. I'll get real with you for a second. Think about it. This is almighty God can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants. He has the power to call down legions of angels, he says. 
But that's not what he says. Because he's feeling human emotions. And he's feeling what it likes to be human. And he knows what's coming. And he knows the wrath of God is about to be poured out on him on the cross. And he feels all of that. I would have said, my time has come. Bring it on. That's what I would have said. Oh, you want to arrest me, do you? Think you got the power to kill me, do you? I mean, I would have, that's not the way I would have responded. But Jesus feels that emotion and, and says to God the Father, my soul is troubled. <laughs> this human thing, it hurts. <laughs> God, Father, this is hard. Wow. To know the pain I'm fixing to feel, it's troubling. I don't know about you. That's the only God I've ever found as I search this world that's worth giving my life to. That God. That, that God that's, that was willing to come down here and feel what this feels like and experience what this, was, what this feels like. Not because he had to, because he wanted to so that he could identify, so that he could be our high priest and could identify with what it feels like to live in a sinful, broken, painful, difficult world. That's a God worth giving your life to. He says, God, my soul was troubled. That's a sincere prayer. We don't need to come to God and act like things don't bother us. We just don't need to do it. It's not good for us, which is the point of praying in the first place. And it's not effective. It just makes things worse. Last prayer we'll look at this morning. And this is right before Jesus' longest prayer recorded in Scripture. John chapter 17. Jesus' longest prayer. We're looking, we're looking at a very short snippet of that. But John chapter 16, right at the end of that, it's right before he's about to say this prayer. Okay? And it's right before he's about to go to the cross and experience all the things that he is going to experience. John chapter 16, the end of verse 30. This is the, the disciples saying this. The disciples say, by this we believe that you came from God. By what Jesus has just said and done. We believe that you came from God. And Jesus responded to them, oh really do you now? That's my voice inflection. But that's kind of the point of what he's saying. Oh do you believe? Okay, we'll see where you are here in a couple of hours. You're gonna run away scared, you bunch of chickens. That's the way I would have said it. Do you believe? Hmm. Verse 32. Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home. You're all fixing to run away scared and leave me behind, even though you just said you know that I came from God. And you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Whew. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I've conquered the world. Now that's some pretty sincere communication. Jesus talking to his disciples. That's some pretty sincere communication. Oh, you believe I, I came from God. You're all fixing to run away. You're all fixing to abandon me. You don't understand it quite yet. Oh, buddy, are you about to understand? It's fixing to make a little more sense. And when it makes more sense, I want you to remember this. As you go on following me, you're going to have trouble in this world. Now, y'all know that I have a personal pet peeve with prosperity gospel. And there's your really good example of why. Because people that tell you that if you'll just put your faith in Jesus, if you have enough faith, everything will be great. That is a lie. Straight from the pits of hell. Because in his word, in his own words, Literally, verbally speaking them as a human being, Jesus said, hey, when you follow me, it's going to be hard. There's going to be trouble. This world, as I'm now experiencing, is a really hard place to exist. 
But be courageous. Because <laughs> this world ain't all there is. I've conquered this world. And it's going to make sense here in about, oh, three days. It's going to make a lot more sense. So he communicates sincerely with his people, with his disciples. And then he goes into this prayer. And I'd encourage you to just read this every day this week. Read John chapter 17 every day this week and just let the words of Jesus' prayers just wash over you and get in your heart, deep in your heart. I challenge myself to do the exact same thing. John chapter 17, right in the middle of this prayer, Jesus says, I pray for them, them, the disciples, and you, and me. We're part of them. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world but for those you have given me, because they are yours. Everything I have is yours, and everything you have is mine. And I am glorified in them. I'm glorified by what my followers do in my name. Whew. There's your responsibility. There's just something worth living for. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in this world, and I'm coming to you. Here it is. Holy Father, protect them by your name, by your power, by your authority that you have been given, excuse me, that you have given me so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus says, hey guys, it's gonna be hard, but be, but be courageous. I've overcome all this hard stuff. Hang in there. And then he goes into prayer and prays the exact same thing to God. God, protect them, protect them. And then catch what he says there. Protect them so that they may be one as we are one. Protect them, God, so that when trouble comes, trouble won't divide. Because trouble divides. Trouble can bring division. Pain and suffering and difficulty can bring division. It's going to make them question. It's going to make them wonder. It's going to make some of them go, you know what? I didn't really mean it. I'm out of here. But God... Protect them from evil. Protect them from that. Keep them together. Keep them unified. He, he prays for our unity because God unifies his people. There's no difference between you and me or any other human being that's ever lived that has placed their faith in Jesus Christ. There's no more value in any single human being that has placed their faith in Jesus over one another. We're all in this thing together. We're all in the world, as Jesus says in this prayer here. Protect them, Lord. Protect them. So I'll finish up like this. Be sincere with your prayer. Pray with the desire to please and know God, not man. Pray with the desire to please and know God, not man. Be sincere in your prayers. Which brings up a question. And nobody likes questions. So here's a question that I hope just digs deep down in your spirit and mine as we leave here today and as we go out and pray as the days come. Are your prayers sincere or are they hypocritical? Is your prayer life sincere? Do you express things openly, honestly, and with care to God the Father? Or, you, or do you pray for things for your will and for your kingdom to come? Are your prayers sincere or are they hypocritical? I want you to catch this. A hypocrite is not someone that messes up. That's not a hypocrite. Praying, God give me strength to have patience this week when so-and-so says something to me at work so I don't punch him in the nose. Hopefully you don't punch him in the nose. But you may not have patience. Right? The thing comes and it's whatever and you're hungry, maybe if you're me, and you say something you shouldn't say and you just don't exhibit patience. That's not being a hypocrite. That's being a human being. A hypocrite is someone who pretends they don't mess up. Not only they pretend they don't mess it up, but then they actively sometimes cover up with religion that they messed up. That's who Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about us that are sincere, that those of us that are sincerely trying to follow Jesus and live for him, but we're in a sinful human body in a world full of pain and suffering and we just mess it up 
on the regular. He's not talking about that. He's talking about all of those that say that, or that, are, that, that, that pray those things and, and try to put on the suit, not, not literally a suit, the suit of I'm okay, I don't mess up. I'm a Christian, therefore I have to be strong and I have to be, I have to be this super human being. And when you bring a, a fault or a sin to me, I say, no, I didn't do that. I wouldn't do that. Not only would I not do that, let's pray about that. You, we, they use religion to cover up their things. War, Warren Wisby says it this way. The hypocrite deliberately uses religion to cover up his sins and promote his own gains. The Greek word translated hypocrite originally meant an actor who wears a mask. Jesus is not saying that it, when you mess up that you're a hypocrite. He's saying that when you pretend like you don't, you're a hypocrite. And the world knows it, and you know it, and it does nothing to honor and glorify God. And we'll talk about in the next couple of weeks more about the, the what in prayers. But that question today is the why. What's the motivation behind your prayers? Do you want to know God and glorify God and make Him known? Or do you just want what's best for you? And do you just want to be heard by man? Let that question dig deep into our spirit as we dig into this series and get more into the what. And I pray, I pray that we will be a people that sincerely desire to know their Savior and to make Him known and that our prayer life reflects that as well.